How you doing, everybody? Welcome back to Before I Forget. This is my video channel, inspired by my Instagram channel, 1985 Road Dog. Uh, on that Instagram channel, you'll find photographs of my life in music, uh, both as a fan and as somebody that worked in the business. Um, basically, I started this uh, YouTube channel uh, to talk about the photos on the Instagram, basically the, the story behind the photo kind of thing. Uh, and that's how this all started. Uh, I appreciate you guys tuning in. Uh, I haven't done a video in a while. Um, uh, a lot of people have been asking me about LA guns, of course, and how they all started falling apart and what happened there and how the, the cracks started to appear in the, in the, in the band. Um, I mean, if you're a fan of LA Guns, you know that they have had, a, I don't know, 50 different members in the band. There's two different versions of the band. Everyone's squabbling and fighting over the years. It's, it's really a soap opera. Um, but I'm going to do my best to fill in, uh, as far as what I know and what I've seen, to fill you in on uh, how it all started and, and where it all went south. Um, you know, I started working for LA Guns in uh, December of 1987. Um, uh, Steve Riley had not been in the band very long by that point. Uh, the first time I saw LA Guns was in, I don't know, spring or summer of uh, 87. And it was the, you know, the original band, but the drummer was different. The original drummer was Nicky Beat, uh, Nicky Alexander, uh, who had played with um, LA band, uh, punk band, The Germs. He also later on after LA Guns played in The Cramps. Nicky Beat's a legendary LA um musician. He owned a, a rehearsal studio called Nikki's Love Palace. Uh, LA Guns rehearsed there. Guns N' Roses rehearsed there. You know, Junkyard, I think Jane's Addiction. Uh, a bunch of bands rehearsed at Nikki's Love Palace. So Nikki's an integral part of the LA scene back then. Um, Nikki was in LA Guns. Uh, they recorded their album. Um, and then, um, you know, there's different reasons why Nikki was let go. Um, you know, Nikki, I've interviewed Nikki Beat for my book. Um, and you know, his take on it is, you know, Tracy wanted a rock star drummer. Um, you know, Nikki was more of like a punk rock type of drummer, but the original LA Guns was like a punk rock type of band. They were like a harder version of the Lords of New Church or they had that punky vibe. They were, they were really more alternative and, and, and punky than they were metal. Um, you know, um, so, uh, you know, the story goes that Tracy one day was in, a, I think, SIR uh, rehearsal studios and Steve was in, and uh, Steve Riley was in there also, um, you know, playing the drums. I think he had just been let go from Wasp. Um, so he was trying to keep his chops up and he was jamming in, in SIR and just playing just to, you know, loosen up. And then he connected with Tracy at SIR and then, you know, um, you know, from according to Nikki Beat, Steve got to Tracy and said, yo, bro, you know, listen, you know, you, you, you just signed a deal with Polygram and you want to be this, you know, big band, but you, you can't be a, a world-class band with a punk, punk rock drummer. You know, in order to be a world-class band, you need a world-class drummer like me, not a punk rock drummer. And Tracy was all over that. You know, Tracy, Tracy just wanted to be big. So, you know, if we got to fire Nikki, we'll fire Nikki. Anything to achieve the fame that I need. So that's what happened, really. Um, but it's funny because, you know, like I said, I interviewed Nikki Beat for my book. And he tells a story one time. You know, the L.A. Guns goes back to 84. Um, you know, Tracy had done that EP, that L.A. Guns EP, black and white cover, uh, which is, you know, that's the one that Axel originally sang on. And then they erased Axel's vocals when he left. And then they had a different guy sing on it anyway. So, you know, um, LA Guns was kind of over after that EP in 84. And then Tracy connected with Mick Cripps, who had just got back from London. Mick was living in London for a while. And Tracy and Mick started a new band and they didn't know what to call the band. Um, and I think they had a gig coming up and Mick said, well, why don't we just call the band L.A. Guns? We've got, you've got all these old posters and stickers and stuff. Let's just call the band L.A. Guns. <clears throat> and that's what they did. Um, you know, this time it's Tracy and Mick. Nikki Beats playing drums. And they had a guy in the band, Robert Stoddard, who uh, Robert was 
you know, connected with all the guys in London, the dogs, the Moor, and all those guys. So, you know, you know, when Mick left London, the dogs, the Moor guys told Mick, when you get to LA, look up this guy, uh, Robert Stoddard. He was going under a different name at the time. Um, I can't remember. He had an alias name. Uh, but anyway, they connected with Robert and Robert became, uh, got into LA guns. So you had Tracy, Mick, Nikki Beat, and Robert Stoddard. That was a version of the band. So um, at some point they had a gig set up, their first gig at the Troubadour. Um, and supposedly um, uh, a bunch of record producers were coming down. Jack Douglas, who produced Aerosmith. They, all these people were coming down to see LA Guns at the Troubadour. Tracy at this time had gone to New York to play on a record by a penthouse centerfold. Um, I can't remember her name right now. Uh, uh, Cheryl Rickson. She was a penthouse centerfold that started a rock band and she was making a record. And she asked, I don't know, Tracy had met her in New York at one point and Tracy went to be on her record, uh, and play on her record. So the rest of LA Guns are back in LA and this gig is coming up. You know, four days away, three days away. Where's Tracy? So finally, Nikki B gets Tracy on the phone, and he says, "Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stay in New York and play. Do this now. So you can keep the name LA Guns, and you guys can just keep it and do what you want." And Nikki was furious. They had this showcase set up the first time at the Troubadour. All these record labels were coming, and Tracy just bailed on the band and told Nikki B. Keep the name. You guys can be the band. I'm going to stay with Cheryl and do this now. That should tell you a lot right there. Eventually, he came back, uh, Tracy. Um, Nikki didn't want him in the band. Mick pressured, I think, Nikki to get Tracy back in. And then Tracy got back in L.A. Guns, and Nikki didn't want him back in the band. Uh, by this point, I think Robert Stoddard left. Um, you know, that's when they got in uh, Paul Black. Um, and then, you know, eventually Kelly came in, Mick, Mick was the bass player in the band. Mick started playing rhythm guitar, Kelly played bass. Um, and then all that happened with Paul Black and then he was out of the band and then Phil Lewis came in and there was the five original guys. Um, and then Nikki Beat was thrown out toward the end of 87. Steve Riley became the drummer and the band changed the entire sound of the band. I always relate it to what Kiss sounded like with Peter Chris. Peter Chris was a jazzy kind of a drummer, took lessons from Gene Krupa. Um, and when they got rid of Peter Chris, or he left, and then they got Eric Carr with the double bass drums, changed the entire sound of Kiss. So it's the same thing with, with LA Guns. Steve Riley came in with double bass drums. Nicky Beat was a single bass drum player, more punk rock, more rock and roll. Steve came in with double bass drums, and they became a heavy metal band. So that's really what happened. Um, you know, uh, Steve obviously his pictures on the first LA Guns record, but he doesn't play on that album. Um, so the first record that Steve played with with LA Guns was Cocked and Loaded. Um, but, you know, again, the tensions were there from the very beginning. Steve was older, you know, six, seven years older than everybody. He had been in Wasp. He had been in a band called The Bees that had a record deal on Epic. He was in a band called uh, called Roadmaster. He was in a version of uh, Steppenwolf. Steve had been around the block. And, you know, when he came into the band, he ended up handling all the business for the band because no one else wanted to do it. Somebody in the band has got to be in contact with the management and the booking agency and the record company or whatever it is. No one else wanted to do it. So, they, so Steve did it because no one else wanted to. So from that, Steve slowly started getting more power and really kind of took over the band and controlled the band, really. Um, you know, um, you know, there was a point where, you know, I talk about this in one of my other YouTube videos, LA Guns was a, had gone back to LA for a week. We, we made the Electric Gypsy video and they were about to go back out on the road and leave Hollywood. And Steve and Tracy got into a, a fight on the bus, not a fist fight, it would have never gone to a fist fight because Tracy wouldn't have won. But <clears throat> they got into an argument about, you know, Steve came on the bus with his wife to say goodbye and Tracy's watching a porno and Steve is, you know, he's an Irish guy from Boston. 
he's all about respect. And Tracy wasn't showing respect. And Tracy's like, well, this is a rock and roll tour. I'm not shutting off a porno. Tell your wife to leave. And then they got into it, man, bumping chests and all that. But it would have never gotten to a fight. Steve would have killed him. But that tension was there from, from the earliest days. Um, you know, I've also talked about that the, the other guys in the band were gung-ho. Three of them had never been on the road before. Phil Lewis had been on the road in England and Europe and Japan a little bit. So Phil had a little bit more touring experience than those guys, but not as much as Steve. But if I would have told the guys as a road manager, look, there's no hotels for the next three nights we're sleeping on the bus, they wouldn't have cared. They would have just drank more beer and smoked more weed and dealt with it. Steve would not have had that. Steve wanted to have hotels, good hotels. You know, he needed, he needed his room moved a lot because it was noises. And, uh, you know, so there was a lot of tension from the get-go, mainly because of the difference in age and experience. Um, Steve was much more experienced than all of them um, in the world of professional music and rock and roll and record labels and managers and booking agents and such. So, you know, the end of that first tour, there was a lot of tension between the original LA Guns manager, Alan Jones, who got them their record deal and supported them for a year and paid their bills for a year while they were making the record and all that. There was a big, big, there's a lot of tension between Alan Jones, the original manager, and Steve Riley. Uh, Steve didn't look at Alan as a, you know, a real manager. I mean, the LA Guns was on Polygram, big label. Polygram had Kiss, Def Leppard, Scorpions, Bon Jovi, Cinderella. All of those bands had big, big management and big, big booking agencies. LA Guns was more of a mom and pop kind of a thing, more punk rock and it's indie in, in its approach to the way the management was. And even the booking agent was really a small agency. Didn't have anybody of any merit other than LA Guns. So for Steve, this wasn't good enough. So by the time that first album and tour ended, Steve pressured the band to get rid of the manager, Alan Jones, and they got rid of their booking agent, which was called Risky Business. <clears throat> and then they signed with Alan Kovac, who now manages Motley Crue. At the time, I think Alan's big band, big act was Richard Marks. I mean, Richard Marks back then was all over the radio. He was selling millions of records. He was a big star. So they wanted somebody that had the big management connections and they wanted a big booking agency and they made the switch. Um, you know, and just threw Alan to the side. Um, you know, they gave him some money and he went away. Uh, but, but you know, the, another difference was Alan Jones, the original manager, was out on the road a lot. He would come out, he'd be on the bus, he was always at the gigs, he was, he was like another member of the band, really. And Steve didn't really like that because he couldn't maneuver because Alan was always there. So when they got Alan Kovac, Kovac's a big manager in Hollywood in a big tower somewhere, he never left the office, really. He was never out on the road, which gave Steve more control because Steve was the guy that dealt with the office and the management. So the manager's never there, it's Steve. So Steve was the conduit between the band and the management. So because the manager was not on the road all the time, he could, you know, kind of take over more. Um, and it might not have been malicious initially, but Steve was looking to cover his ass, really, you know, put money in his pocket. Um, you know, so by the time he got to Cocked and Loaded, you know, it was... I thought they went way in over their heads. When they started Cocked and Loaded, the, that tour in 89, the first L.A. Guns album was gold. Never went platinum. So they went out on their second album with a big headlining show with two opening acts. L.A. Guns, it was all their, their whole production, their stage, their lights, everything was L.A. Guns' responsibility and they had to pay for everything. I went to the first show of that tour somewhere in Texas. Mick invited me to come out and hang out for a while. So I, cause I had stopped working for him by this point, but I went out there and I pulled up and I went into the back of the venue and I'm like, man, there's like four buses and three trucks and trail tractor trailers. And how are they affording all this and doing all this? They've had a gold album. Like I, I just didn't understand it. I thought they should have been still opening for people, um, doing, you know, doing your odd headline in a theater or something here or there. But, you know, L.A. Guns would have definitely benefited by going out on the road and headlining. 
uh, I'm not headlining, but opening for a big headliner. Um, you know, they lost that Motley Crue tour because of the, the stuff that went down with Kelly and Cherie Sneal. So that kind of screwed things up for a while. But I thought they should not have had their own production and bed out on the road with their own thing off of a gold album uh, with no radio play. So I thought it was a bad decision. But again, I'm sure Steve pushed for that. Um, and the other guys went along with it, um, not wanting to upset the apple cart. Um, you know, so, um, you know, there were, there were other incidences, you know, I know Steve and Tracy had a little issue at one point, you know, um, even at the end of 88, you know, there, when LA Guns, I, I believe it was 88, when they went to Japan, Steve ended up tripping and hurting his ankle really bad and he couldn't play for a while. So LA Guns came back from Japan and had to go back out and do clubs. And Nicky B came back and played drums for a month, which a lot of people don't know that. Steve couldn't play because his ankle was all screwed up. So Nicky B came back and played. So, um, you know, I'm sure Steve didn't like that one bit. So, you know, anyway, by the time you get to Hollywood Vampires, um, there are some bad incidents with Steve and record company people. Um, you know, I'm not going to get into the details of this, but Steve had a very bad scene with the A&R guy that signed L.A. Guns in a public place in front of a lot of people. It was not good. And the A&R guy, this is in the middle of Hollywood Vampires tour, he just quit. He said, I'm not, you know what? I'm not dealing with this crap and I'm not going to represent, I'm not going to be your A&R guy anymore. And like that, L.A. Guns was over because they got a new A&R guy that had no clue who they were, what they were about. Plus, grunge was coming in. Um, but, you know, the big incident that everybody talks about and knows is when, you know, the, they were on tour with Skid Row in Europe on the Hollywood Vampires tour. And, um, you know, Steve swatted Phil in the forehead and the face with a rolled up newspaper. Um, you know, I had, I, I had always been in contact with those guys. You know, I constantly heard from some of the guys in the band because we were friends. So, I mean, I was constantly getting the updates. You know, they were on tour with Skid Row. Phil Lewis, God bless him, he's not, he's not Sebastian Bach in, in 1991. I mean, Sebastian can wail. So Phil was having problems. He was struggling, you know, uh, not sounding great. You know, Phil, Phil's voice was not the greatest voice. It was a unique voice, but it wasn't the greatest pure singing voice. He had to take care of himself. He had to really watch himself, you know, uh, so he wouldn't lose his voice. And he was struggling on that tour. Steve was grumpy about who knows what. And then one morning at breakfast, um, you know, Steve came down to breakfast and sat down with those guys and he was grumpy and bitching to the road manager about this and that and this and that. And then, you know, from what I heard, Phil said something like, what's the matter, Steve? Didn't you sleep well last night? Because Steve is famous for always moving his room because he can't sleep. And Steve just went over, reached across the table with a newspaper and smacked Phil in the head. And Phil was shocked. And the, everybody else at the table was shocked. And Phil wanted to quit the band right there. He was talked into staying. We've only got three more shows. Let's do these three more shows and get back. And once they got back to LA after... Europe, Cockton, uh, Hollywood Vampires, Phil said, called the meeting and said, look, I can't be in a band with this guy. It's either me or him. So they fired Steve. Um, and then uh, Hollywood Vampires was not the breakthrough album they thought it was going to be. Um, and then the band kind of started dissolving. Um they did that Cuts EP. Um, they owed Polygram another record with Vicious Circle. By this point, Tracy had quit. I think Tracy and Phil got into a spat and Tracy quit the band. So by the time they had to do this album, the last album for Polygram was Vicious Circle. That album was put together by Phil Lewis, Kelly Nichols, and Mick Cripps. Steve was out of the band. Tracy quit. Um, there's a lot of musicians on that record. If you look at the credits to, to Vicious Circle, there's a lot of different people on that record. Myron Grumbacher, who's a great drummer, he played with Pat Benatar and a bunch of people. He played on it. Um, at the very end 
um, I think what happened was Polygram found out that Tracy wasn't in the band and they weren't happy. They're like, no, he's got to be on this record or we're not going to accept it. So they had to get Tracy to come back and play on a couple things. So I think Steve came back and played on a song and then they went out and did um, <coughs> did a, a tour for Vicious Circle. I don't think Steve did that tour. It was a different drummer, somebody that was in the band for like a minute. Um, and then, you know, the band got back together at one point and there's been different incarnations and, you know, L.A. Guns is just, <coughs> it's like a soap opera, like I said, so. But, you know, the, the cracks in the band unity were happening in 1988, man. Um, you know, I, again, I could go into a lot more detail with this. There's some things I just don't want to talk about. Um, a lot of it's in my book, though. So uh, update on the book. At this point, I'm just going to self-publish because I can't get a, a publisher interested. So I'm going to self-publish the book. So hopefully sometime, you know, early next year, it'll be out. But, you know, stay tuned to my Instagram and, you know, I'll I'll uh, fill you in there, of course. Um, but that's it for this chapter. Uh, again, I, I wanted to just kind of get into the, the tension with LA Guns and how they started fragmenting. Um, but there's so many incidents. I mean, I could talk for hours about this stuff because it, it just little things that you think don't matter, matter. And people don't forget and they harbor resentment and, they, and, and, and it, if it's not resolved, it'll lead to the, you know, the band breaking up or people leaving. Um, anyway, thanks for tuning in. I really appreciate it. Um, 1985 Road Dog. Um, leave comments. I appreciate all your, all your comments. Uh, <coughs> I read them all. I respond to them when I can. Um, thanks again. Hope you're having a great life. Speak to you soon. Ciao.